to begin actually uh, saying a few different things. Uh, Nick, those of you who weren't here uh, at the start, got everyone to put their hands up and identify from different groups. And I had to put my hand up for the regulatory <coughs> group. Um, I don't work for a regulatory organisation, I work for a celebratory organisation. I'm going to give my pitch there because if we are going to be positive and have this action, I love that, that, that quote which I've never seen before about being pessimistic in analysis and optimistic in action. I'm going to be optimistic in action. We are here to celebrate and win hearts and minds. Uh, I'm also going to take that opportunity to celebrate some particular individuals, first of all. Many of you will have seen on social media uh, uh, a lot of unhappiness and unfortunateness about the session yesterday in SIPA, which was entirely a male panel. I'm an old white man uh, talking in a primarily entirely uh, male session here, and several people just challenged me to say, come on, identify the really good, strong female leaders in politics and heritage, and there are plenty. And so I want to give you a couple of names first of all, before I move on into this, uh, to, to tell you to go and look at these people and see the wonderful work they're doing. Uh, some of them are obviously in my self-interest to congratulate them, but I do it not as an employee or a, an officer through me. Deborah Lamb is the Deputy Chief Executive of Historic England. She's not very well known, possibly, because she works so incredibly efficiently and ably and is one of the best people I know of. And it makes me really positive and celebrated about knowing that I've got such a good leader. Celia Richardson is our Director of Communications, and she's another person who makes me want to do this and makes me impassioned about it. And I'm confident with leadership like that that I can persuade people of the benefits of lots of different aspects of heritage in this post-Brexit <coughs> world. So with that said, uh, I'll move into my main presentation. And although I'm primarily talking about uh, statutory regimes, I do want to put it in this broader context. Uh, read nothing from the depressing skeleton Lego picture, it's purely that my feeling is any first slide ought to have a, a fun picture, and because I have a four-year-old, I'm obsessed with Lego right now. Uh, I just want to make it heritage Lego. So I'm talking about statutory heritage, and I do make the emphasis here too that while we're at an archaeological conference, and that uh, while I am uh, an archaeologist by training, uh, in terms of my perspective of what I do and my, my desire and my interests, I see myself as being absolutely inclusive of heritage, that uh, I'm learning so much about the broad historic built environment. Indeed, many of the case studies I will show to you uh, actually are drawn very much more broadly than that. And a good starting point and a good challenge and optimistic action for you is, for goodness sake, we are so bloody good at fighting, not uh, even, you know, just within the heritage sector, just the archaeologists against the built-in historic environment people. We have got to get out of this, and it is one of the really big reasons why we struggle sometimes with our message. I'll also therefore talk in this broader context of the planning environment and the environmental management uh, landscape, which has been identified and, and flagged up by a number of different people. You cannot take these things in separation. So, so my primary role is inevitably uh, focused uh, largely on the statutory regime, but you have to see it in the, in the round. It's crucial, and we're all aware of it, that Brexit or no Brexit, we live in very, very changing cultural circumstances for how we engage with heritage. And it's an interesting challenge. Right at the beginning, uh, there was the challenge of there'll be no change at all. Uh, and it, it's a good point. Actually, are we simply talking about Brexit bringing into sharp focus a number of different cultural trends which were already underway in this nation? The question of deregulation and the move, the, the move we are seeing right now towards a more and more deregulatory environment, it is an interesting hypothetical attitude. Is this a permanent long-term change towards smaller government decentralization, that sense of Little England, if you want to call it that, or is it a cyclical thing that we tend to see, we are seeing right now, and we will eventually see a desire for bigger government again? I honestly don't know, and I change my mind nearly on a daily basis when I observe, as an individual, policies and practices. Devolution fits into that as well. These are deeply uh, linked to that broader Brexit question, but they are, cannot be divorced from it. 
I'm really, really curious to see, uh, from a personal perspective, the aspect of the relationship uh, with the other home nations of the United Kingdom. What <coughs> will happen, for example, if Scotland, uh, as it's starting to look really increasingly likely, becomes an entirely independent nation? What will be the question marks of, of the border relationship, literally, on heritage in such a space? And I don't need to flag up to a, a group of people such as yourselves about the broader issues there of public engagement and involvement and, and the, the really different landscape that we are now seeing for how members of the public actively participate in heritage on the one hand or more passively consume it through media in various different ways. This therefore places really big challenges on us. We've seen this questioning at the place of the experts. I have to be extraordinarily careful uh, in my professional life in particular, about that sense of being the preaching expert. I'm, I am particularly nervous of that again as I become more and more grey and uh, 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 fit the traditional model of the preaching old white man. We have the really interesting opportunities, and this is the positive side, about asking questions about what a national narrative looks like, and in this sense I mean national in that English sense, that it is not an absolute given that it will be uh, an uh, absolutely established, <coughs> shall we say small c conservative uh, national narrative. And, and one of the roles undoubtedly of organisations like Historic Kingdom is to challenge. Some of you might well want us to challenge more aggressively. I would argue uh, perhaps through self-interest, that it is about gently challenging and giving that, that range of different perspectives. One of the best things uh, that my comms department always gets me is to remind me that I am there for all taxpayers. My job is not to be too impassioned, and I know some people don't like that, but that is the nature of heritage bodies in the modern world. If we are to win hearts and minds and have arguments, we have to give that range. I'm going to talk about those in a minute. But there are some real questions though. What is the place of a cultural heritage agency or a heritage agency, whatever you want to call it, in the 21st century? Some people would like us to be deeply regulatory. I would like us to be more celebratory. There is a case to be made for a more proactively, almost policing role. The concerns of damage to sites, the issues of heritage crime, be they uh, deliberate or inadvertent, are always with us. And one argument could be that we should spend our entire time uh, simply trying to very proactively stop damage to sites afterwards. A different question is that one there. Such a thing is enough heritage. There's a number of individuals in this room who work closely with me, and we are facing a real question, which I've put out to you all, because I'd love to know your views on it, which is, is there such a thing as enough heritage? The particular driver for us this year is it's the 70th anniversary of the Act of Parliament that brought her out listing. So in many ways, it's the 70th anniversary of the group to which I belong. Around about this same time, we're going to cross, not quite sure when, 400,000 assets on the National Heritage List for England, this, this key record we curate on behalf uh, of the government. Now, in some ways, that's wonderful. 70 years, 400,000 things, 400,000 glorious, exciting things. On the other hand, it's 70 years. 400,000? Really? Are you sure? Uh, and, of course, all of you know that, well, some of those things have been on that list for a very long time. And, would they fit the same criteria, the very rigorous criteria that we nowadays expect? Uh, while we might celebrate, we might also draw attention to fundamental question marks. Maybe some people would say that is far too much and quite enough heritage. Thank you very much indeed. And of course, we all know that there are considerable variations. For a very long time, up until very recently, uh, that the things on that uh, asset list very much fit uh, convention, or should we call it, narratives of heritage. And we have got a very big journey to do, to go into raising areas of less well-known heritage or more contested. There are some really big issues here. With Brexit, let's be positive about Brexit forces us very, very sharply to focus upon. We would have been focused upon them anyway, let's be positive and say, 
Brexit is our opportunity to say, okay, we're going to have to challenge ourselves. And maybe that is navel gazing. But if it's navel gazing, which will lead to better heritage, okay, with that. Because uh, I'm shooting, um, uh, I'm, I'm talking too much. I'm going to overshoot this slide, which I'm still unsure of anyway. Um, I didn't realize that we have Paul uh, 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 sitting in the audience, and uh, I've chosen a site probably not a million miles from where he lives. But the reason I chose this with is part of this challenge I've been putting to myself and others of what would it be like if uh, we stopped doing so much heritage and we didn't have some of these national narratives. And I chose Clun because of the old Houseman poem about the quietest place under the sun, and I thought it was nice. And, 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 and I also happen to rather like Clun. It's extremely charming place, although I wouldn't want to live there myself. <laughs> so I, I thought, OK, what happens if we do a hypothetical? What if we take not the centre of Newcastle or the centre of London or great, uh, very well-known locations, but actually here's good. Who's been to Clun? OK, disproportionately large portion, strangely <laughs> on this side of the room, the Clun committee over here. Um, those of you who don't know, it is a charming but very small uh, Welsh border, English Welsh border village, a uh, small town. Um, there is uh, the National Heritage List map for it uh, with all the heritage sites on it. And there, if it works, is what happens if I sweep my, my well, I don't know what, um, um, alien-like power across it and get rid of that heritage. Well, of course, what it does is it takes out a whole load of different things. It takes out the bloody big castle to one side. It also happens to knock out the listed bridge and almost everything along the high street, uh, a nice set of arms, houses, uh, and a whole load of things. And, and this is what I've been playing around with, but it's an interesting intellectual challenge of maybe we need to be not aggressive in a thou shalt do way, but reminding people, if you know what, you would miss this more than you perhaps think. Because Khan wouldn't be destroyed by that, but it would be very much diminished by that. I've got about 10 minutes left, haven't I? Something like that. When we're looking at priorities, inevitably and quite rightly, we meet, at least in part, the desire of government. I am, um, I, I am unashamed in doing that. I work for the government, uh, and their priorities can be my priorities without absolute loss of uh, ethical, moral identity. Should we be working on issues like infrastructure and government disposal? Some of you might well say no. I might have personal views about what type of infrastructure. But there are really interesting questions to be raised by sites such as the beautiful Curzon Railway Station, uh, which there it is in its grandeur, and there it is in its rather uh, diminished but still very fine grandeur, uh, might well be, the may well be, the uh, terminus of high speed two. You don't have to love or loathe high speed two. It is becoming one of those things that just seems like a, a giant uh, rolling snowball. Uh, my job is no longer to think about the rights of the wrongs of it, but to think about what the best I can do for heritage and communicating that heritage and tying it clearly to buildings like that, but telling that interesting story. I'm always driven, for example, on railway heritage, which I've, I've, I've become uh, painfully obsessed with as I, as, as I retreat ever more in, into middle age. Uh, uh, and I, I face every day on my morning commute a great big cutting in central London, where I live in Kentish Town, which was entirely hand dug by Irish navvies. And I am conflicted by the fact that it seems so industrial on the one hand and so incredibly personal and individual. And I think of the individuals uh, who, who are there and the fact that my neighborhood still has a strong Irish identity fundamentally to do with 200, 300 years of movement of peoples, even though nowadays uh, that is very likely gone. So questions like that and how I get narratives over like that, I think terribly important. Um, I will move on. These just give a sense of some of the priorities of historic England that I'm particularly working on. They aren't necessarily corporate priorities for everyone, but within my bit of the listing group, this is a lot of the kind of thing we work on. A few of the examples. And when we are, again, talking about celebratory and being positive and thinking about good things, here are some of the narratives that I want to focus upon, and I like to think about how we can persuade people. I am an archaeologist who loves brutalist buildings. I'm bloody proud of that. 
And I know some archaeologists hate breakfast buildings. You're wrong. They're lovely. <laughs> They're lovely. And I love them. I've grown to love them. A bit like I go to love many things. Uh, but particularly I love them. And you know what? This country has a fantastic heritage of cutting-edge post-war architecture. And we can use buildings such as this one fairly recently listed at the University of Reading, home of CIFA, to ask questions of people and provoke people and say, we believe them to be beautiful. You might disagree, but these are the reasons why we believe them to be beautiful. And the, how they work in relation to larger landscapes. Post-war university landscapes where so many of us uh, spent their early formulative period of their lives are crucial places to actually stand back, go back to these places and reflect. Some of us are going back um, um, in a couple of weeks' time to the University of Southampton, where, where apparently half of historic England uh, was originally changed. A fantastic post-war university landscape. Go back and stand there and think about those kinds of design landscapes with their Barbara Hepworths and the Henry Moores, things like that. I touched earlier upon underrepresented heritage, that's one way of calling it, that worries me as a term, but you know what I mean, bits of heritage where traditional narratives, shall we say, conventional narratives haven't dealt with so much. This is one of the most favourite sites we protected um, last year, which is a beautiful, incredibly subtle piece of natural rock outcrop up in Cumbria, which was scheduled. It's a, it's a conscientious objective stone, it is not a formal thing, it was carved there by conscientious objectives literally hiding out. But they were hiding out there because they were hiding out in a farm uh, just below this rock outcrop, which had been used by, in turn, uh, Quakers and Republican rebels and suffragettes and conscientious objectives. And it has a heritage. That landscape is a deeply natural, I want to call it, it is, a, it is an open, you know, <laughs> upland landscape with deep prehistory into which they have left this mark, there is a fascinating story. And it is important to tell those stories. And we are, you know, for all of the, uh, the difficulties we face in making our case, that emotive connection to individuals and that ability for people to feel what would it be like to be on the run, standing up for my values, is something that we can really grasp and get to see. And here's a different one, which I... I find myself strangely drawn to, but yet deeply challenged by, because it's a, if ever there was a site to my mind which can ask so many different, difficult questions about heritage, it is one like this. These are gunboat sheds. Literally, they are emblematic of 19th century high imperial gunboat diplomacy. Literally, gunboat diplomacy. They were designed to store gunboats in Gosport. We've listed them grade one, the highest possible grade of listing you can have. They therefore fit a fascinating and deeply important narrative of international geopolitics, and they are also absolutely emblematic of all the worst excesses of British high imperialism. We need to tell both of the stories. They also, for me, with my original maritime archaeology mindset, remind me profoundly of classical boat sheds such as seen all around the Mediterranean because basically you drag a boat up a narrow thing to work on them and, and you know I, I nearly put up a picture of, of classical boat sheds on top because I think the, the, the stories are so overlapping there. Three different examples of really challenging and interesting sites and I have big questions myself about how I use this as part of the post-Brexit narrative. So my conclusions, well, one of my conclusions is uh, at lunchtime, don't go and talk to one another at lunch, go over and look at the fantastic brutalist Newcastle Civic Centre, which is depicted on here. Nearby, go and see the grade one listed uh, um, uh, War Memorial, which is a fantastic civic landscape of commemorative identity. The Civic Centre is a thing of pounding beauty. <laughs> I beg of you, go and see it. I love that building. I know many people don't. But I hope I have made the point about these buildings and, and our approaches being about usefulness and how we do need to have this emotive sense. I was so pleased that Kevin, you know, known so many of us, 
He cares. <coughs> My God, we've got to care. There's that lovely video of Michael Sheen, the actor, talking about caring for the National Health Service. Can we please get some of the passion back? Some of that caring, because I think we've lost it some of the time, about it being emotive and fun. Um, and I'm going to shut up. Just a reminder of this is how you can see the kind of stuff we're up to. Joe Blackman is me being irritating. Historic England is the former one. And the maritime one is for those of you who love wet, horror, historic stuff. I'll, I'll shut up. Thank you. <laughs>